God, I miss making love with you. Ah! Here comes species two, and we thought, well, what? How could that possibly be different? I mean, we'll just make some more. And then they showed us the list, and some more meant 30 times more. We always try to use uh, new materials, um, always thinking outside the box, and um, always striving for something, you know, that does look CG. You know, that's what we're kind of, you know, something from another planet. Each task on that film, we did some pretty cool stuff on, and I was really, really pleased with it. I mean, stuff that unfortunately, well, unfortunately for the effects industry, would clearly be done digitally today. Anybody that takes that chance to create something that's never been seen before, or strive to create something that's never been seen before, even if you fail, you still, in my head, succeed because you're reaching for something that is not the norm. Oh, this is awful. This is just awful. The original species, um, as well as species two, it was all you know done under Steve Johnson's XFX banner. There was always a drive to create something that had never been seen before. And keep in mind, this sort of predates, you know, visual effects, as, as you know, in terms of you know computer-generated imagery, you know, like we have now. It was a scary sci-fi movie with boobs. I mean, what more could you ask? alien boobs. The drive was always to create something in camera that would uh, be as impressive and I've always said that you know he was the the guy and the shop that got as close to producing computer generated imagery before computers than you know than anybody else. I kind of got into the effects industry because it was a burning desire within my soul for um, ever since I can remember. I mean, first of all, before I was old enough to even watch movies, I liked to make things. I would take coffee cans and decorate them with construction paper. I'm talking about when I was five years old. And then when I started watching movies, I was magnetically drawn to horror films and science fiction. There were just movies at that point to me, but at some point as I began to mature, and I'm talking, you know, being like eight, nine, ten, I started thinking, now wait a minute. These monsters that I really like, somebody's out there making those things. Wouldn't that be a cool job? I think, uh, you know, working at Steve Johnson's, he, he always tries to push for uh, uh, practical. And I, I think he's always saying, I, I, we can do this, you know. And, and now, nowadays, the, uh, the visual effects people will kind of be talking to the director and say, well, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And, and some directors still to this day like to see practical things. I think the actors really like to see practical things. Well, Species 2, uh, same producer, Frank. Mancuso Jr. Frank came to me and he said, okay, this is how much money we have. And it was a pretty nice amount um, for all of the effects in the movie. Whatever's gonna be done digitally, whatever's gonna be done practically, but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give all this money to you and you decide what's gonna be done digitally. But what I want your, your marching orders are to do everything that you possibly can in the real world practically. And I'm like, this is great. I think it's some of the greatest practical effects I've certainly ever done because you know, there was a great degree of trust from the producer's point of view because he'd worked with me on Species 1 and saw what we did. Just let me go. I mean, I just can't believe some of the sequences that we actually had the nerve to pull them off. I mean, there are 20-foot tentacles doing shit that they shouldn't be able to do. I think a lot of it was practical because, like I said prior, you know, at this time, there wasn't a lot of CGI, you know, being used, you know. is certainly not for, for monsters. Uh, maybe environments and, and spaceships, that kind of thing, but not for creatures, creature effects. So a lot of our work was practical. One of the difficulties was, uh, you know, digital technology was not very old at this time. And uh, Richard Edlin at Boss Film, 
you know, rightly realized that with the action and the script, we not only needed our full body animatronic and all the pieces that made the action happen, but, you know, for the broad action of this translucent character leaping around that he would have to do it digitally and he'd never done a digital character before that. I always think the best blend of uh, is to try to have things practical and if things need to be polished a little bit or if things have to move differently than we can achieve uh, in the budget. I think that's probably the best uh, marriage of the both of them. The only real disappointment that I have with Species is that we went to all this trouble and expense to do something that was pretty groundbreaking at that point. Had we not done The Abyss, we wouldn't have been able to do this, which was to make the character, as Giger designed it, almost transparent. You could see it's understructure. But the DP and the powers that be, really good DP too, no matter how much I begged and pleaded, would never back or rim light the character. So that's how you prove it, right? You know how you shoot rain? Unless there's a backlight on it, you don't see it. Well, if you shoot something translucent that's lit from the front, you're not really going to see that unless you light it from the back and see straight through it. But I think that had something to do with matching the digital one. Uh, in, in retrospect, it looks like. So I was a little disappointed in that, but the movie's good. That was a huge undertaking, you know, because basically you're kind of redoing the Giger alien look as a very elegant, female, beautiful, yet monstrous kind of character. H.R. Giger designed the, the character, Sil and a lot of the effect sequences. Giger had drawn these shapes, and then when we matched them, he didn't like the way they looked. He said they looked like bananas. You know, again, I think Giger's thing is, I wanted to make him happy on Species, because he wasn't so happy. He'd never been happy. Unless he's doing it himself. He's a real artist's artist. And unless he's doing it himself, he's just angry. So, you know, I wanted to listen to him. I wanted to make him happy. For the first time, have H.R. Giger be actually happy with someone he had tasked to create his stuff. Now, I did have something going in my favor on that one, because if you take a look at anything Giger's designed from a, for a film, the myriad things that other people have ripped off, that are just clearly biomechanical, they've always been male. But if you look at Giger's work, 99.999% are always female. So I thought this is amazing. We've got an opportunity to do a true Giger thing. And he actually came by our shop and, you know, myself, a big fan of aliens. I actually got to talk to him on the phone. He would, he would send us notes about uh, certain things and, and I got to talk to him on the phone. I'm thinking, this is, this is crazy, you know. What, what kind of life am I living where I can do this? He, all he really wants is he wants to be heard, you know, like any artist. Uh, and a lot of times in projects people don't really listen to him because they're under budgetary restraints and monetary restraints that he's not. He's staggering around, fucked up on whatever drug of choice that day in his castle in the Alps and, uh, you know, just making a few phone calls and faxes and then angry when his mind isn't translated directly into the third dimension, his thoughts. So I wanted to make him happy and guess what? I did. One of the funniest things about it is that he would send, he would do in his patented Giger style, uh, if the producer, if Frank Mancuso Jr., the producer, made him angry over something. Because Giger, when he sinks his teeth into a project, he really, really wants his stamp on it. He wants every frame to have. So he not only designed the creature, he designed some of the sets, and he certainly designed the killing techniques for almost all the murders in there. He designed a lot of that film. You know, as it transforms, there's a lot of a lot of stuff, but you know, I, again, you've got the reality of making this stuff, and then you've got this crazy artist in the Alps. Thinking stuff is a huge difference between thinking and creating in the real world and then getting it on set to film it in time. So when he would get angry, he would draw incredibly detailed photos of Syl with some appendage coming out of her butt-fucking the producer so hard that it would explode with blood and vomit out of his mouth. He was clearly Frank Mancuso Jr. being fucked by Syl. And he would, and he'd write these terrible things. And I'm not, this is not just one time. Over and over and over. It was pretty funny. We did a scene where there's an, there's an, um, and I think this is when we just, I flew up for the weekend or something, where there's an autopsy body and they open it up and this big creature just comes out and shoots right at them. And I think that was a, a good effect because it's a, it's a shock effect. You don't, I don't think you anticipate it at all. So I always like those kind of effects where it uh, uh, comes out of nowhere. Oh yeah, we did everything. Uh, what, what comes to mind immediately is another, none of those wonderful patented Peter Medak shots. We got a full-blown dummy with a shotgun in his mouth. 
perfect hair punch, totally realistic. Camera comes around, boom! Total slow motion, head blows. Really, really proud of that. And there's a scene where he's uh, uh, making love to <laughs> the actress, and I guess he impregnates her, and she uh, quickly gets pregnant, and then she gives birth to um, one of the creatures. It was tough. I mean, that, that baby birthing thing, I can't tell you how many operators it took, and the woman, basically, the old half body through a wall trick, if you got your wall here, the actress is coming through like this. You've got her arms, her face, but then we blend out a pregnant belly and a pair of fake legs. So then we have to, from behind the set, behind the fake wall, get all our cables, levers, and people. I think the baby was a hand puppet. I don't know how it worked anymore, but you know, it took so many operators. This is the one bad thing about practical effects is that the, the nerves before you, you know, the director says action, all I can do is cross my fingers and hope the damn thing works because this took probably 12 operators and they all had to be in such perfect orchestration or the whole thing wouldn't work. So I'll just give you an example right here why I'm so proud of this stuff. For instance, when the little kid gets pulled up, the little boy reaches up and does this to his nose. The camera starts moving on his nose and the big weird tentacle comes out and then it snakes back in. And then he looks up and the tentacles start growing out of his nose, his mouth, and his eyes. And they shoot up to the ceiling and literally pull the kid up, and then a cocoon gets built around it. How we did that is we made an oversized piece of the kid's head. We literally sculpted a huge head and made a mechanical, you know, because we couldn't get a great mechanical piece that was this big. So we made it oversized. The guy's nose was probably, you know, that, that big. So we made a little mechanical thing, and that was for the push-in. The little boy puppet, um was supposed to kind of go into a fetal fetal position like this. What we did there is we put a little piece of the floor on the ground, a little small area of bricks and then a green screen ground. We literally made a steel armature that was jointed exactly like a human skeleton. And then we cast a solid silicone. We made, a, of course, a mold and a sculpture of the boy. We cast a solid silicone very expensive, but ultimately what you get with that steel armature that's jointed and the weight of the silicone, you get a human, a little boy that weighs the same as a human, moves the same as a human. We had the little kid dummy upside down and it was hollow and things got pulled out of it. That was cool because, you know, any uh, special effect where you're, where you're changing the, the uh, reality to make it feel better, it always strikes a chord in my heart. So we mount it on the ceiling, put the camera here, kid's upside down, stuck on the ceiling, and we put like 14 foot tentacles coming out of his eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and we just yanked them through his head and then reversed that. So, and we also mechanized his head to look up. So in the film, you see the kid, the camera's here, you see the kid look up and then all this stuff. Then we went in for close-ups that were specific effects that go where you see the tentacles latching onto the ceiling. Then we pulled this full heavy body of the kid up and you know put cables on so it ends up going into a fetal position. My job was to uh, cut the whole thing apart and put it back together and make it go into that fetal position. So that was one of them. And once it got all the way up there, then a digital cocoon grew around it. And you can clearly tell the difference. So it was a lot of work for that one particular scene to make it work. And I think it looks pretty, uh, pretty good in the movie. Patrick, uh, he, uh, we dealt with him a little bit with the, uh, called the, the love-making uh, puppet that we made of him. There's a scene where the Patrick character is having sex with a girl, and the camera is doing this nice circular track, or it's on a track, the camera goes all the way around, and you see tentacles erupt from his back. We made a, uh, pretty much an exact copy of his whole body. We made, a, again, a full body silicone nude duplicate of Patrick that was mechanized to fuck. That also was mechanized to have these tentacles grow out of it. There's this puppet that we make of him and he of course does some of the scenes where you see his face and then we replace it with the puppet. And it was naked. I mean every hair was put in individually. The head was you know, mechanized who was doing the fuck thing. And, you know, a lot of it was just uh, kinetic reaction, but a lot of it was mechanical. The way we got the, the thrusting is we have a real girl on the bed with her legs spread. We put the puppet on top of her in the right position. But in order to get the full body to do the thrusting, we had a, a huge rod 
coming between the girl's legs and through the bed. And we had a guy under there doing this on a fulcrum, right, on a, on a pivot point. So the gross body movement of doing this was, and these, as, as the, the girl dug it because it turned out that it was like a $100,000 dildo shaped like a man because that rod was literally doing what a real cock is supposed to do. I think one of the main things that I was involved in was this lovemaking scene between um, Eve and Patrick. The sex scene and the water I was really pleased with. We, we shot all of that. So the subliminal messages you see, uh, where you see flashes of crazy sex. We put giant like six foot crab claws and tentacles everywhere and we put uh, strobe lights, backlit it. It involved a lot of underwater effects. We had some vacuform castings of the various characters we had. Just weirdness floating through the water, and we got the girl in a sill suit, the guy in a bizarre alien suit, it wasn't quite the Patrick monster, but something close to it, and just had all the swirling madness in it. We go from Eve in, you know, human form to Eve in alien form. And the idea was to take her skin and somehow melded into the alien version, the, you know, the Giger, you know, version of herself. And the way we did that was we inject a flesh-colored methicel between the alien version and the human version, both, you know, clear vacuform castings. The methicel fills up the human version, creates a human-like torso. In reverse, you've got this human-like torso and in the throes of this lovemaking scene, it starts to shift in a, in a very unusual way and then in sort of rivulets because the methicel is thicker than the water and sort of like these little tentacles gets absorbed into this alien shell which then is combining this sort of the beauty of the, the Eve alien with this sort of monstrous Patrick creation was, you know, it was an interesting combination on, makes for interesting dance partners on screen. It was interesting, we were in a, a sound stage and I think the whole barn was an actual barn that they took apart and it was an extremely old barn and they took it apart and then rebuilt it on an old wood so it was a lot of dusty wood that probably had a lot of bugs and spiders and, and we were just trying to uh, hang all the chrysalis and I think we had to do it that, that one weekend. We were supposed to put in 30 of these uh, cocoons into this barn set. Really all I remember of that is hanging a lot of those chrysalis cocoons that, that we had made in the shop with Lenny McDonald um, till the very small hours of the morning. We took the uh, uh, plastic bag technology, which is Bill Bryant, uh, to as, as far as we could go with this. Bill Bryant had come up with this, this way to pull and stretch these plastic really garbage bags into interesting shapes. So when you inflated them, whether with methicel or with air or water, what have you, they would amazing go from almost nothing to you could get these giant things. The plastic bag will do a sort of a pulley routine and, it, and it's very lively looking and very much a living creature. Um, we found that by, by yanking the, on the plastic, you can make uh, texture on it. Climb up here, hang one, wires, monofilament, crazy 200 monofilament lines coming out of this and little motors in this one to make it do its thing. The veins that would go onto the ceiling uh, were like kind of like a, I want to say like a combination of a chain link fence and a Chinese uh, finger torture thing where basically when they would inflate they would also constrict and kind of go like this. Just bags of things and you know you tie little monofilaments on the inside of this bag you know so when it's inflated you can pull it and then all of a sudden there's mouths on it and it's really incredible thing and then these chrysalis you know uh, effects were loaded with those and then you put slime on it and you get enough slime on a on a bag and actually it turns out that the the plastic bag is the mechanism for the slime you get slime moving through space like that and it's just it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, it was a long night of hanging chrysalis. There was the, uh, the cocoons. There were tentacles that sprang out. We just shot, I mean, air cannon blowing out long uh, wire 
Yeah, I remember Michael T. We had to do an effect where a tentacle grabbed at him and pulled him. So I got to work with him a little bit. One of the one of the cocoons shot out a tentacle that wrapped around him, and it it wasn't heavy and it wasn't strong. He just had to mime it. I hope it came across as being as as forceful as as we intended. Thank you. One of my, the memories I have of Michael on set. He he came around. He was uh, he was looking at the. Uh, at the the cocoons in the barn and he saw the mechanism and it was just a big piece of two by two with strings on it and a motor he said look at that mechanism my eight-year-old son could have done a better mechanism than that <laughs> and I said well where is he we need him working on this <laughs> but of course that was one of the reasons we used that mechanism because it was something that uh, it was it was pretty foolproof uh, the Patrick Monster, oh my God, that was a difficult one. We tried so many things, so, so, so many things on this. Um, I mean, it was huge. The Patrick Monster was, you know, it was a monster. Here's what happened with, McGeeger was brought on again to design. So he refused to start designing until he had a signed contract, that makes sense. But I was already brought on the pod project and I'm crossing off the days with X's like a prisoner in jail until the shoot date and I'm getting no design. So I'm like, fuck this, this is my responsibility. I'm the guy who's gonna have his dick on the chopping block come the first day of shooting, not Giger. He's gonna be doing his thing in the Swiss Alps, playing with his train sets and shit. And so I just started experimenting, doing mock-ups, and we did all kinds of stuff for the Patrick Monster. It had like two heads at one point that, you know, a lot of really interesting transformation effects. You know, and I was in the shop, and I, in some of it, I still can't wrap my head around how it was done. I mean, really, really a pretty amazing character. It was, it was so complex. There's a person inside of it, which is basically having stilts on his arms, and stilts on his uh, legs. We had leg extensions that gave the character a backward bent leg. So off his feet, the legs came up to here. Um, his, the, the performer inside the suit. His arms came out of the torso. The torso is longer almost than a full human shape. So his arms came out of the torso and they grabbed rods that operated the creature's fake legs from the front. And then the head was completely, the, the head movement was um, hydraulic, so it was really smooth. You could do anything, cable, uh, cable control mechanisms to do all the facial activities. It split in half, did all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but then we, you know, because we had to take the guy's weight on an overhead gantry, like if we knew this creature had to move from there to there, we had to set up a rig out of frame above that had a system of pulleys and casters on it that went straight to a flying, flying harness through a hole in the suit. And the guy's wearing a flying harness, so we took his weight on that. And we literally had to puppet, it was like a huge puppet with a guy doing some of the stuff. It's very time consuming to shoot. At a certain point in the movie, he, um he gets up, and I believe he's shot. And a lot of the stuff was done with uh, a vacuform plastic, which is uh, uh, described as, uh, when you do something in fiberglass, it's a hard shell. This is basically a sculpture, uh, vacuformed uh, in thin plastic, so it's lightweight. It can be painted translucent or opaque, and overall give it a lightweightness, and that's what we needed for the project. I uh, had this crazy hair, if you remember, like a slinky, you know? Imagine a slinky that has uh, plastic wrapped around it. It had all this kind of almost dreadlock hair that could be pulled in and out with vacuum cleaners blowing on or off, sucking in and out. We found that if you took three of these little dryer hoses, tapered uh, conical dryer hoses, and you glued them to each other lightly, not enough to stiffen them up, but enough to so that their each one's movement would affect the other. If you suck back on this one and inflate this one, then you get a wonderful curl. And uh, then you do that in the third dimension, it becomes a three-dimensional curl, like a like a um, uh, a ram's horn or a kudu or something. And that was another uh, Bill Bryant kind of uh, project, and it was pretty exciting. The the hair was really neat and different too. A, a great moment in movie history. When I first saw Species 2, I saw it at the screening, cast and crew screening. I think it was, uh, like I said, a good use of, of both uh, practical and a little bit of the CG that they used. <laughs> it's a long time ago, and you know, a lot of water's uh, gone under that bridge. I think it was a good movie. It's nice that uh, 
people respect the piece, respect the, uh, the movie. I'm glad that it's uh, achieving cult status of, of, to some extent. I was blinded because I was really happy with our effects. And I never, ever say that. I was just so happy. Maybe I was happy with the opportunity to be able to go so far and try things that most people wouldn't try. Um, and maybe the movie isn't good. I'm just delusional because of my effects. But I, the whole experience was actually really good for me. It was really fun for the whole crew. Whenever I watch a film the first time, I watch for mistakes. You know, I watch for the things that, oh, is it obvious how we did this? Could this have been done better? You know, where, where are the edges? Where is the, you know, where are the rods? Where are the strings? I don't remember watching it for that. I remember, you know, just watching it and enjoying it. So that's a good sign. Yeah, I mean, my team, some of the best guys in the business that I've worked with for years and had before that, so we all had developed kind of a short term mental telepathy, which is always great when you're working closely with someone. Um, Lenny McDonald, uh, Joel Harlow, Eric Fiedler, uh, God, I can't even remember, I believe Chris Nelson. People that have gone on to win Oscars and Emmys and open their own studios, so it was like an all-star team. I would say I'm happy with the work uh, that XFX, you know, Steve Johnson's team put out with, put out on, on that show, you know, because it was some very innovative work. My favorite still is probably the, the original, but I, I think it was a, a good um, telling the, of the rest of the story, you know, because the story shouldn't end yet. And, it, and it, of course, it continued to Species 3. Yeah, I did Species 3 uh, under my own banner, um, which was a very scaled down version of the first two. I don't know if uh, Steve Johnson was uh, busy at the time or if he passed on it. So uh, I'm pretty sure that he was contacted about it. Yeah, no, Frank called me back on uh, Species 3. We couldn't agree on a price. I mean, you know how sequels go. They get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. We couldn't get, agree on a price. And so, I mean, it was a very busy time then. So the, you know, I wasn't very hungry, so I didn't, I didn't need the job. Um, and then I just found out today there's a Species 4, so. <laughs> If you're out there, Frank, I'll do Species 5 for you, though. Let's see, I insulted Giger, Peter, Frank, the guy that wore the suit. No, I think we covered. <laughs>